Please be seated. Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a big difference between the word if and the word when. And since today happens to be Valentine's Day in addition to Ash Wednesday, I'll give an example of this to you that comes uh, with some kind of romantic element to, to it to demonstrate the difference. Fourteen years and one week ago, Leah and I got engaged. Now, as you might expect, when I proposed to Leah in Horlack Park in Edmonton, uh, I was rather nervous, uh, so much so that when I pulled the box out that had the ring in it and opened it up, I actually had it upside down the whole time, so the ring wasn't pointed up, it was pointed straight out at her like this, which I didn't realize until she pointed out to me that I had it all disoriented and wrong. That's how nervous I was. In hindsight, however, I really had no reason to be that nervous at all. You see, sometime before I proposed to Leah, a number of months previously, I don't remember exactly when, we had started to use the word when instead of the word if in our almost nightly phone conversations. Leah and I at the time lived about two and a half hours apart, and while we would, were dating like this, we would talk on the phone almost every single night of the week, and it was the phone bills ra racking up that were the reason why we just needed to get married and go on with things. But anyways, like I said, these phone conversations, in these phone conversations, we made a switch. I don't know if it was knowingly or consciously at one point in time or another from talking about what it would be like if we were to get married someday or if that were to happen or what we would do if we were together in that kind of way to all of a sudden talking about when, when, what it would be like when we were married, what we would do when we were married. And there's a big difference between those words, between the word if and the word when. The word if has a degree of uncertainty about it. When we use the word if, we're indicating that something may or may not happen. We may or may not do something. But the word when is much more definitive, much more certain. When we use the word when, we're indicating that something is eventually going to happen. When we use when, we're indicating that this is something that we are eventually going to do. And so when I proposed to Leah all those years ago, I really didn't have that much to be nervous about. We had already made this shift in our conversations from talking about if to talking about when. Now, in turning to our gospel reading this evening, this distinction between if and when is significant because in this reading, we hear Jesus use the word when instead of the word if on three different occasions. And each of these whens that we hear from Jesus is significant. Our gospel reading this evening, it comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. It's a portion of the scripture that we often call the Sermon on the Mount, which covers Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, it's an extremely important part of Scripture. And maybe we don't give it as much attention as we probably should. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spells out for us what his disciples, both then and now, do. What it looks like to be one of his disciples. What it looks like to be one of his followers. Very clearly and very poignantly, he tells us about our lives as Christians and how we ought to live in this world. And here, in our gospel reading this evening, we're right in the middle of all of that, and Jesus uses this word, when, three times over. When you give to the needy, Jesus says, 
Sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. When you pray, Jesus says, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. And when you fast, Jesus says, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. When, when, and when. Jesus uses the word when three times here. When you give to the needy, when you pray, and when you fast. Now, in each of these statements that we heard from Jesus, he's making a similar point. Jesus is indicating here that he doesn't want his disciples, back then or now, to be making a show of their Christian lives. Giving to the needy, praying, and fasting, Jesus says, are not things that we should be doing in order to impress other people and show them how holy, how Christian we are, or something like that. This is an important point. We should remember this. But what I want us to focus on here this evening is that when Jesus uses the word when here, he is very much indicating that each of these three things, giving to the needy, praying, and fasting, are things that we ought to be doing in our lives as his disciples. We shouldn't do these things in order to impress people. That's important to remember. But we should be doing these things. It's a matter of when, Jesus says, not if. The question, however, is why. Why does Jesus use the word when here instead of the word if when talking about these kinds of things? Why does he say when you give to the needy, when you pray, and when you fast? Why does Jesus say that these are things that we will do, at least eventually, in our lives as his disciples? We know it's not because we can somehow save ourselves from our own sinful condition by doing these kinds of things. The scriptures are very clear about that in plenty of other places, and we need to make sure we keep that in mind here also. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and by Christ ultimately alone. Our salvation is apart, separate from, in every way, shape, and form, any kind of work that we could possibly do. Giving to the needy, praying, and fasting then, they can't make up for our sins, they can't earn us eternal life, or do anything else like that. So why do these things matter? Why does it matter if we give to the needy and pray and fast? Why does Jesus use the word when here and indicate that these are things that we will be doing? Now, the best way to get at that question, I think, try to work our way to an answer, is to look at each of these things individually, giving to the needy, praying, and fasting, and think a little bit about why it is Jesus would want us to do something like that. So let's start with the first one, giving to the needy. Why would Jesus use the word when here when talking about giving to the needy? Now, we can probably come up with a number of reasons, kind of just all on our own here, about why giving to the needy is something that disciples of Jesus ought to be doing. After all, it's something that even non-Christian people tend to think is probably a good thing to do. Christians aren't the only ones who give to charities, who help out poor people or something like that. But the main reason, I would suggest, why Jesus uses the word when here when talking about giving to the needy is that this is something his disciples will do because being a disciple of Jesus means extending Jesus' own ministry, Jesus' own work out into the world. When you read the stories about Jesus recorded in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one word that comes up time and time again is the word compassion. 
Jesus has compassion on people. He has compassion on sick people, and he heals them. He has compassion on a crowd of 5,000 hungry people, and he feeds them. He has compassion on people who are lost. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They have no one to lead them, no one to teach them. So what does he do? He teaches them. And ultimately, he has compassion on all of us on sinful human beings like us, each and every one of us, and offers up his life on the cross for ours. When we give to the needy, therefore, all we're really doing is just following in the footsteps of Jesus and continuing his work, extending his work out into the world by having compassion just as Jesus has had compassion on us. We, of course, don't have the divine ability to do the kinds of miracles that Jesus did, but Jesus isn't asking us to do that either. He doesn't say here, when you miraculously heal people, or when you feed large crowds with just a little bit of food. He just says, when you give to the needy. All he's saying is that we, as his disciples, ought to use what we have been given, even if it isn't very much, to carry on his work of love and compassion. And if you think about it, it really is kind of a privilege, an honor, to be able to carry on what our Lord Jesus has begun and has done himself for us. So that's the first one, giving to the needy. But what about praying? Why would Jesus use the word when here, when talking about prayer in our lives as his disciples. Again, we could probably come up with a number of reasons thinking about why prayer is a significant thing for us. And I'm sure many of us realize already the necessity of prayer in our lives as disciples of Jesus. But again, here with this one, and something stands out to me above kind of all the other reasons. Jesus speaks about prayer this way, I would suggest, because being a disciple of Jesus means entering into a relationship with God, God Almighty, as your heavenly Father. Our gospel reading from Matthew chapter 6 this evening, it leaves out a few verses. Maybe you noticed there in the bulletin there's a dot, dot, dot at the end of verse 6. It's because we can't always fit everything in. We've got to leave some things out. And what got left out there where that dot, dot, dot was, was the Lord's Prayer. It was right there in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus looks at his disciples and says to them, when you pray, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. Being a disciple of Jesus means entering into a relationship with God Almighty as your heavenly Father. This ultimately is what Jesus has done for you by having compassion on you and dying on a cross, offering his own life in your place. Rising from the dead, he has made you a child of God. He's brought you into this relationship with God Almighty. You are his beloved child. He is your dear father. You are a son, you are a daughter of your Father in heaven. And if you think about it, it just makes sense then that we would pray. Relationships, as you know, require communication. A relationship in which there is no communication is really no relationship at all. Within this relationship then, God our Heavenly Father speaks to us through His Word and we, in turn, respond in prayer. It's the natural flow of our lives as disciples of Jesus. And again, just like giving to the needy, if you really stop and think about it, it's a privilege to be able to call God our Heavenly Father and talk to Him in this kind of way. So that's two out of the three down now, giving to the needy and praying. There's one more of these whens left to go. 
But if we're honest, this last one is probably the one that seems like the strangest to us. When you give to the needy, makes sense. When you pray, we kind of just get that one. But when you fast, comes out of left field a little bit for us. Why would Jesus use the word when, when talking about fasting? Fasting has actually kind of become a popular thing uh, these days, but not necessarily for the kinds of reasons that Jesus is thinking or talking about here. When Jesus says, when you fast, he isn't interested in example for the various health benefits that may or may not come along with intermittent fasting or anything else like that. That's not what Jesus is concerned about here. He's not offering you a diet plan. Instead, when Jesus says, when you fast, he's doing so because he wants us as disciples to have our priorities right. Since our bodies require food and other such things in order to remain alive, uh, food, quite naturally, becomes a pretty big priority in our lives. And on a certain level, there's nothing wrong with that. But it does also sometimes push up into one of ultimately the highest priorities in our lives. But remember what Jesus said to the devil, to Satan, when tempted out in the wilderness, tempted to turn the stones on the ground into bread. Jesus quoted from the book of Deuteronomy and said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Food is important. Please hear me saying that. Food is important. But our highest priority as disciples of Jesus should not be food. Not the normal kind of food anyways. We're more than just bodies. We're more than just creatures that need to eat. More than anything else, we need God's word. Because God's word is what shows us the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ. The compassion that he has had on us. God's word is what shows us how he, our Lord Jesus, has given his life so that we could be adopted, brought into the family as children of God. God's word is what points us to everything that our Lord Jesus has done for us to forgive our sins and to give us eternal life. And so when Jesus says, when you fast, what he's urging us to do is to get our priorities in the right order, to put God's word in the place where it ought to be. For us today, fasting could take all kinds of different forms. It might mean, according to the strict definition of the term, skipping a meal here or there, or going for a time without eating. But it could also mean something much more simple than that. It could mean simply just giving something up that's distracting us from listening to God and his word, whether that thing is some dietary thing or whether it's something else that's drawing our attention away. Not, like I said, for any kinds of health benefits or anything like that, and certainly not to impress other people, but to better focus our hearts and minds on the one thing we truly need, God's word. When you give to the needy, when you pray, and when you fast, Jesus teaches us a whole bunch of stuff here in just a few words about what it means to live as one of his disciples. And if we take all of this seriously and take seriously the fact that Jesus is using the word when here, not the word if, it's hard not to notice that we haven't always done everything Jesus says that we ought to be doing, at least not as often as we probably should. But that, I think, is one of the blessings of a time like Lent that we're entering into now. Of course, we don't need to do Lent. We wouldn't have to do this if we didn't want to. Jesus never said, and when you practice Lent. Never even said, if you practice Lent. 
But Lent is a beneficial thing, I think, for at least two reasons. First of all, Lent is a time to be intentional. To be intentional about these kinds of things that Jesus says we ought to be doing, giving to the needy, praying, and fasting. We could and should do these things all the time, of course, but specific times of being intentional about things like this can be good. Just like Valentine's Day or birthdays or anniversaries or other days like that are good days to be intentional about telling the people who are important in our lives that we love them. But secondly, and even more importantly, Lent is beneficial because it's a time of repentance. It's a time when we recognize and admit that we haven't been everything that we're meant to be as disciples of Jesus. And when we admit that, when we confess our sins, we know that our Lord Jesus Christ is faithful and is just to forgive our sins. There's no ifs here either, by the way, because he died already to take all those sins away too. He died for you to take away your sins. And when it comes to Jesus and his forgiveness, it's a matter of when, not if. And the when is always now. As St. Paul said in our epistle reading this evening, now is the favorable time. Now is the time of grace. Now is the day of salvation. So let's keep this season of Lent, not because we have to, but because we can. Let's give to the needy, let's pray, and let's fast as we prepare to celebrate the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all the while, let's rejoice in his forgiveness, which covers all of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We join to sing the offertory on page 192. I invite you to...